Good morning, church. Maybe you have lost track, or maybe you'd rather not, but I counted them up, and this is our 70th weird Sunday in a row. (laughs) Woo! And last week, we announced yet another transition in the way our Sundays go, and the way we've been worshiping together. Uh, Next Sunday, we'll be flipping the tables, uh, so to speak, in our in-person options, uh, moving the stage back indoors, um, providing a large TV under the awning if you'd uh, like to continue meeting outdoors. And if you're joining us online, no change. Keep doing that. Um, I think this is the seventh change in the last 16 months. And I really, really hope and pray that it's one of the last. Every announcement that we make represents hours of meetings filled with prayer, debates, conversations, and considerations with with a team of about a dozen people. Our last meeting was two and a half hours long. And this isn't me complaining, but confessing that I am tired. I'm tired of being weird. And not just me. I'm, you know, that's not going to change. I am tired of innovating and, and being creative. I'm tired of talking about the pandemic probably as much as you're tired of hearing about it. It's okay to be tired. I have said this many times, and I'll say it again. It's okay to be not okay. This has been exhausting and hard, and it's not over yet. We're close at least here in our part of America, I truly believe that we're on mile 24 or 25 of this marathon and at the finish line. It's coming up soon, but we're hitting that wall, folks. I'm not a marathon runner, but I I feel that after uh, a quarter mile. And for many of us, this has been and will be the hardest challenge of our lives. And that's true for us as Christians as well. It's true for our church. How do we keep going? That's the question I perhaps consider the most in these last 16 months. How do we remain faithful? How do we keep going and doing what we need to do when we're exhausted? How do we remain consistent in our integrity and in our beliefs when we're just tempted to to give in, give up? You know, I've had to check myself a lot lately, asking if I'm making a decision uh, because I believe it's a good one or, or just because I'm just tired. Maybe you've felt that as well. But even without pandemics or plagues, the challenge of faithfulness is not a new one for God's people. This winter, we went through the book of Revelation, and that was one of the main themes we saw in that book 2,000 years ago. The question of, will we be God's faithful witnesses? At the end of this life, will we hear the words from God that all Christians long to hear, well done, good and faithful servant? Faithfulness is a marathon. It's a lifelong endeavor. We must live full lives of faith and obedience to God's will and be consistently dedicated to God, not just when it strikes our fancy or when we feel like being faithful. For when we, when we talk about faithfulness, one of the most common contexts these days is that of a marriage and being faithful to your spouse and to the vows that you made on your wedding day to have and to hold from this day forward, for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish till death do us part. That 
is a pledge of lifelong faithfulness, no matter the circumstances. Can we say the same to God? Can we fulfill our vows, our pledge of faith, in all circumstances, through every season of life, whether it is one of bounty or one of famine, through both tears of joy and tears of sorrow? And on the other side of that question, will God do the same? Will God be faithful to us, no matter what happens? Will God be faithful even if we are not? The answer, which continually speaks throughout the words of the Bible, is resounding, yes. Great is God's faithfulness. This summer, we're going through the fruit of the Spirit, which Paul lists in Galatians 5. It's a series which I'm calling Locally Grown. For the Holy Spirit of God is within us, bearing fruit among us here in our local communities, here in Livonia. We are God's garden, God's orchard. How have you seen the gardener at work? How have you seen the fruit of the Spirit lately? I'm asking that question each week for each fruit. And today I'd like to share how you responded with how you have seen faithfulness lately. Elvira Brown said, On Thursday, I received a rather disturbing phone call from a family member, but however upset I was, the only thing I could do was to pray to God for help. Prayer in and itself is calming, but in addition last evening, I noticed the one little garden light out by the fence that refused to work before was shining brightly. And I interpreted it as God telling me that he was with us and faithful. Uh, Terry Karras must have peeked at my notes. because She shared, All those Christians who have shown great faith in our good Father through this very difficult time of the pandemic, we have trusted in his promises to take care of us by living courageously, fully confident that whatever happens to us personally, we will continue to live to serve him or leave to live forever with him in our heavenly home. There is no greater peace than to know that we have, not for a minute, gone through this dark time, without his loving presence beside us. This is a peace that the world does not know, and no wonder they have so much fear. Cindy Lapp had a great list of examples of faithfulness. Sandra Burton and her faithful service as granny to the majority of the congregation, whether she's actually our granny or not. <clears throat> Michael and Jane French, Rick and Jam Sims, faithful service in teaching and leading our Bible Bowl teams, which is coming up soon. Larry and Diane Stevens, faithful service to the kingdom and to the Livonia Church. Matt Breton and the entire AV team for their tireless and faithful service to make our worship time happen technologically during these last 16 months. And finally, Beth McKee shared this. The members of our Stephen ministry have shown tremendous faithfulness through regularly meeting together and with their care receivers. I have been blessed to be part of this ministry and blessed to receive care from it myself. Without the commitment to continue caring for people in struggle, this ministry would fall apart. Praise God for blessing these wonderful people with faithfulness. And I like the way that Beth worded that, that the source of their faithfulness is God. Uh, does that make sense? That we can be faithful to God because God gives us faithfulness. God gives us the power and strength to endure, to keep running, to keep living out our faith because otherwise we wouldn't be able to do it on our own. The Holy Spirit of God lives within us, empowering and equipping us to do God's will, bearing its fruit in our lives and in our communities, in all the ways that we've been talking about this summer, and that includes faithfulness. God is faithful, and therefore God's Spirit cultivates faithfulness in we in whom the Spirit dwells. 
Great is thy faithfulness. We sing that in a few different hymns and, and songs. I'm not a very confident song leader to lead, Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. But we know this. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not. Thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. Or in a more modern song, one that I can probably handle is, The steadfast love the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I will hope in him. I love both of those hymns, whether I can sing them or not. But both of them, but especially that second one, draw from one of the best verses in the Bible that talks about God's faithfulness. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. Now you may recognize that, and, and maybe you can place it as being from the Old Testament, but do you know what book of the Bible it's from? Lamentations. It's not a book that we spend a lot of time in, though maybe we should, especially after this last year. I, I know some preachers who've gone through the book of Lamentations in the last uh, summer. Lamentations. It's the product of the worst time in Israel's history. Jerusalem had been destroyed by their enemies. The temple had been burned to the ground. And God's people were carried off from their homes into exile. And God had made it clear that through God's prophets that all of this was the dire consequences of Israel's unfaithfulness to God. And so he was going to show them what it would look like if God's faithfulness were to be removed. And it was hard. It was brutal. And yet in the midst of this time of darkness and lamentations, here emerges a thin beam of light. Great is God's faithfulness. God's compassions never fail. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. Can we say the same in the midst of our own lamentations? And if so, how? How could the Israelites do it? How did they know that God was faithful? Uh, we, we see this. We see them proclaim this truth throughout the Bible, particularly the Psalms. In fact, in three different Psalms, we see the exact same verse repeated. For great is your love reaching to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the sky. And yet all three of those psalms were spoken during times of trial and suffering when their enemies were upon them and they cried out to the Lord, save us. How did they know that they could trust in God's faithfulness then? Because the very nature of faithfulness is consistent dependability. Someone who is faithful is someone who can be trusted not just for a very long time, but all the time. You don't have to wonder if they'll do what you hope that they'll do, even though they did it yesterday. And you don't have to wonder if they'll do it even after they've done it a thousand times, because they are faithful. Perhaps faithfulness can be best described by one of the most beautiful phrases in the human language, even if. God is faithful even if. How do we know? Because God has consistently proved his faithfulness 
over and over and over again. God is consistently dependable and always has been. And so to answer that question of God's faithfulness and the Israelite respond, just look at our history. Listen to our stories that have been handed down from generation to generation. Hear about God's faithfulness to the descendants of Abraham, even in Egypt, even in the wilderness of Sinai, even when we grumbled and complained, even when we were not faithful ourselves. And so if God was faithful even then, God is faithful even now. Even if. In response to God's faithfulness, can we do the same? Can we return faithfulness with faithfulness? Can we be faithful and remain faithful? As I said in the beginning, that's one of the overarching questions of the Bible and of the Christian church. And fortunately, not only is the Bible filled with stories of God's faithfulness, but with examples of God's faithful people. We've got several examples that we can look and be inspired by. And one of the most notable examples has several stories that we can look to. A man named Moses. When God called Moses into service, God knew his faults. And and he ignored Moses' list of reasons why he was the wrong person for the job. Uh, Sure, he wasn't the best public speaker. But God saw something in Moses. God saw faithfulness. God needed someone that God could trust to get the job done despite all the challenges and the crises to come because there was going to be a lot of them. Someone who could remain faithful to God's mission under, even under enormous pressure to give up and give in. And to demonstrate Moses' faithfulness, we can talk about Pharaoh and, and the plagues. We can talk about the Exodus and the Red Sea. We could talk about the grumbling and complaining of God's people in the wilderness. Their attempted mutiny against Moses and so many more stories. Throughout it all, and for many decades, Moses faithfully obeyed God and faithfully led God's people despite never wanting the job in the first place. But there's one story from the life of Moses that I want to look at today that may not stand out to you as a great example of faithfulness, but I think it's one of the best illustrations of it. And it's found at the end of Exodus chapter 17. The people were traveling through the wilderness and complaining about it the whole way. God had just demonstrated his faithfulness to them in the form of manna and quail, keeping them fed in the midst of the wilderness and providing water from the rocks so that they wouldn't go thirsty in the desert heat. And and then they still resulted in grumbling and complaining after this. With the threat of hunger and thirst had subsided, they weren't alone in the wilderness and they quickly found that they had enemies among them particularly the Amalekites a nomadic tribe that was descended from Jacob's brother Esau and we read at the end of Exodus 17 that the Amalekites attacked the Israelites who were particularly vulnerable since you know they were (laughs) they weren't exactly a traveling army they were a people without a home and Joshua had some Some strong fighting men, though. And so Moses told Joshua to lead them into battle. Meanwhile, Moses was going to overlook from a hill with the staff of God in his hands. And as the story goes, whenever Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning the battle. Whenever he lowered them, the Amalekites were winning. And this would be fine if it were just a short skirmish, but it was a lengthy battle. Now Moses was, he was old. He was already in his 80s or 90s by now. And and even in my 30s, my arms would be getting tired. But fortunately, Moses wasn't alone. His brother Aaron and his friend Hur were on the hill with him. And whenever Moses' arms grew tired 
they, grew, they gave him a rock to sit on. And we're told that Aaron and her held his hands up, one on one side, one on the other, so that his hands remained steady till sunset. And so Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. Moses got tired. I mean, he had a right to be. But when he couldn't do it by himself any longer, he found help by his side. And when we read that they helped his hand remain steady till sunset, do you know what we read in the text? In the original Hebrew, the word steady is the same word that means faithful. And when it's applied to people, it also means trustworthy and dependable. See, Joshua was depending on Moses to keep his hands up. But if it were just up to Moses, that battle would have been lost. But fortunately for everyone, Moses wasn't alone, and neither are we. See, if faithfulness were an individual thing that was just up to us, I don't know if any of us could do it. How do we keep going when we're exhausted? How do we remain faithful to God when we feel like just like putting our arms down and giving up? In those times when we can't do it alone, we need people in our lives to hold our hands up for us. Faithfulness by ourselves is an impossible task. We aren't strong enough. But faithfulness in community is achievable because we help each other to be faithful. That's why God gave us each other. The Holy Spirit of God lives within us and it's present among us. The Spirit bears the fruit of faithfulness, helping us. Helping us, not me, not you, but us to be faithful and steady through all that we might face together. Our faithfulness isn't imported from far away, but it is locally grown here among us. It is right here in our midst. And when we look back on this pandemic, we will be able to tell our own stories of God's faithfulness and how God was at work and how God gave us the strength and endurance to be faithful ourselves. And when we grow weary, we will not give up. We will not give in. But by the power of the Holy Spirit of Christ, which He has given to us, we will hold on to one another's hands and we will help each other keep them lifted and steady and faithful until all our battles are over and when we emerge victorious once and for all. For this is the gospel we are preaching. And the good news we are proclaiming, not just with our words, but with our lives. Yes, church, we are proclaiming it with our faithfulness, even if. And may the world see it. And may they know the enduring faithfulness of the God that we love and serve. And may God... Receive all glory and honor and praise. Amen.